country and very often all around the world. Oh, someone from Joshua's hometown. Hey, Dan. <laughs> Dan has, uh, I have known Dan since the very first photo I've ever taken. He helped me pick out my first camera, pick out my first lenses. That's super cool. Yeah. That's super cool. And I'm very, it's really nice to see him lending moral support over here. Oh man, he's my biggest fan. And uh, Dan's a great guy. We, we used that's to- uh, That's wrong because I'm your biggest fan, John. <laughs> Dan and I used to go out shooting, uh, shooting birds a lot. Uh, when I first got started, I used to do a lot of bird photography. And Dan and I used to go have a lot of fun with that. We used to work together back when we were into, when I was into engineering stuff and it all started there. Very, very cool. I'm actually, what I'm doing is I'm trying to actually get my second screens on so that I can there. monitor, uh, so I can monitor cool. chat on, because you're going out. I'm actually, what I'm doing is I'm trying oh, to oh, and I got my second screens on mute my, uh, so I can there. monitor, uh, so I can monitor chat on, because you're going out. I'm actually, yeah, 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 yeah. Shut up, Jim. There we go. All right. I'm better now. Oh, hold on. there we go. So, um, all right, well, we've only got a couple of minutes left before we get started. We have someone from Canada. Hey, Josh, we're not successful at getting together in Yosemite here in Concord, Massachusetts, looking forward to this presentation. Well, you should, because you know what? I've seen Josh's presentation and it is awesome, mainly because you, you share your photos with us. <laughs> hey, do you, um, uh, we're just in a minute. Do you want to flip to the um, Jim? Oh, by the way, Jim Kotra, if you'd please uh, turn off your uh, camera. I would appreciate that, sir. And um, Andrew, do you want to put up the slide with the coupon? There we go. So, on our webinars, virtually every webinar is, um, is uh, celebrated with an opportunity uh, for you to get a very good discount. Oh, he's a good guy. Of, uh, Tom Magnuson. Yeah. I'm sorry, I do need mics off, please. Mics off, please. Anyway, um, we are offering 15% off the complete range of uh, Nisi filters and accessories, everything except the lens. So now Barbara and Jim, if you would please turn your cameras off. Thank you. Um, and Josh, I'm not even sure if you're aware of this, but uh, you know, we are the distributor of Nisi in the United States. You know, we represent the factory that makes the products in uh, China, but we're an independent company of the, of the DC factory. And we have started a new brand called Explorer. And before you get started, I briefly just want to show people about Explorer, including you, Josh. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to see it. There, here it is. It is a, um, it's a brand of camera accessories, but let's let the video fly. I was promised music. I'm not getting any music, but it's kind of good. <laughs> it's it's basically camera accessories, ball heads, tripod, um, small tripods, lights, L brackets, including an L bracket for the new Canon R5 and R6. That little tripod would have been very handy. <laughs> they're they're very very handy. That one right there. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, you know. We could talk but about you know that. you know a guy. <laughs> I know a guy. I know a guy who knows a guy. <laughs> Jim Cotri and uh, Myrna De Jesus and James Saxon. If you could please turn off your cameras, we're going to get this. Uh, we're going to get this show on the road, and uh, we'll show you the coupon code again at the end, and you can get fifteen percent off of all Nisi, all Explorer. The only thing that's excluded is our new fifteen millimeter ultra wide lens which uh, you really should check out online. 
It's uh, pretty nifty. Josh, Josh Snow is an internationally renowned landscape photographer, award-winning. Um, our most requested ambassador to talk about uh, his book photography to our Nisi friends and family. And it's a very special night tonight. He's, um, he's sitting there on painkillers and uh, gonna force his way through a, a fantastic presentation. We're gonna try and wrap it up in an hour so that he can go to bed. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to get back to my nap. <laughs> it's all yours, sir. All right, hey everybody, I'm Joshua Snow. Uh, hopefully you guys will enjoy my presentation tonight. Uh, I use filters in, uh, in a few different ways. Um, maybe a lot of non-traditional ways. Uh, I am a big fan of blending images and different parts of images, kind of dissecting them, deconstructing them and putting them back together. Uh, so I use filters for overcoming certain dynamic range issues, for uh, creative effects, um, but sometimes the filters uh, may not have the effect that I want in all parts of the photograph. So sometimes I will activate a polarizer and I'll use it for certain parts of the photograph. I'll deactivate it, take other shots and then bring them all back together in the end to kind of get the best of all of the things that I want to include with or without a filter. Uh, so I have a little presentation for you today. It's just going to kind of walk through some of the things that I use and how I use them, some uh, image examples that I'll explain and how I use the filters. So give me one second to get that presentation up here for you. And here we are. Creating magic with Nisi filters. Uh, sometimes I feel like I am creating actual magic. Uh, I like to take what I see in the real world and, and sort of breathe more life into it, new life into it. I want to create a world that, that I want to see. Uh, I know that my work is uh, and maybe not for everybody, but uh, this has sort of become uh, what I live for, uh, creating these really unique, very dynamic, very ethereal, magical images. So I hope you guys enjoy this. I think we all are here because we understand a little bit about what filters are. And there's a million of them. And of, of course, in this hour, I'm only gonna be able to cover a few of them. And I'm only gonna really cover the few that I use personally in my work, the things that I find the most practical, keeping in mind that sometimes I'm backpacking, sometimes I'm hiking a long way. Uh, so I don't carry the full arsenal of Nisi filters with me wherever I go. Uh, and they're not a new invention. They've been around since the beginning of the camera because there's always been creative effects that people have wanted to, to use in their photography or to overcome, um, you know, again, dynamic range issues or you know, not all filters are as old as time, but some of them are. Um, you know, and as filter technology kind of advances, we we find new uses for filters or new ways to use old technology and filters. And even now with drones, um, using filters for uh, night photography has even sort of come around in the last few years. You know, one filters that will help filter out some of the light pollution in heavily light polluted areas. Uh, so there's a lot of cool uses for filters. Uh, and they all sort of work differently. Some of them block UV light. Some of them uh, filter uh, like a polarizer. They would, it would filter the glare from shiny surfaces or glass or water. Uh, ND filters that'll help essentially slow your shutter speed, speed down. It's like sunglasses for your camera. Uh, and you've got gradual ND, graduated NDs that'll help uh, dim down very dynamic scenes with a horizon. Um, you've got reverse graduated NDs, there's, there's, a, there's too many to list. Uh, the ones we're gonna talk, to, talk about today are circular polarizers, neutral density filters, and graduated and reverse graduated neutral density filters. Because I feel like these three, four types of filters uh, for me are the most practical. 
Um, they're, they're the ones that I would suggest to all students or colleagues or other landscape photographers to have in your kit. Um, with, with digital photography and post-processing, there are a lot of things that we can sort of overcome without the need for filters. Um, and those time, and that does have a time and a place, but there are certain things that you just can't replicate uh, with, without using certain filters like a circular polarizer. So the very first slide I have for you here is, is circular polarizers a must in any photographer's bag. Um, they're absolutely essential to me, uh, especially when shooting water of any kind, flowing rivers, streams, uh, waterfalls, anything that has a lot of lush green foliage or any surfaces, uh, rocks that could be moistened by the water, the mist of the water. Um, they also have a place uh, in, in other types of photography like street photography or, or uh, architectural photography to, to, like I said, help with, with reducing glare on, on reflective surfaces. But um, circular polarizers, if you've ever played with one, you have to rotate the polarizer in order to see the effect. And, and a lot of that has to do with your position to the sun, uh, the angle of the light and the way that it enters the camera. And you'll notice that uh, at certain times of day, the polarizer seems like it's ineffective. And, and, and again, that's because of the angle of the sun and the sky and, and a few different factors. But uh, essentially a polarizer is made up of two lenses. There is a linear polarizer, which helps sort of filter the light by itself. And then there's a quarter wave retarder. And as you rotate that quarter wave retarder, it sort of changes the direction that the light enters that filter. Uh, and that's when you see the, the glare sort of disappear. Uh, so it, they're kind of magic in and of themselves where they can take this harsh, nasty glare on water surfaces that's coming from the overhead ambient light and remove that so that you can see stronger reflections. It helps saturate uh, you know, lush green foliage, grasses, leaves, plants. Uh, and it adds, because of the reduction of glare, it, it helps strengthen or give structure and contrast to uh, the surface of water, especially water that's flowing where you've got the bubbles and the streams of water. And then you've got the slack water where you can see the rocks beneath and you can see all of the texture there. And, uh, polarizers are brilliant and, and they're a fantastic thing to have in your bag. And if you've ever gone and shot uh, any of those sort of scenes where you've got flowing water and plant life and you've shot it with a polarizer and then you've shot it without a polarizer, you, you've noticed a big, big difference in the quality of those images. Um, three years ago, so this was actually before Jim's time. I was in, I'm sorry, 2017, almost four years ago now. I was in the uh, Pacific Northwest in Oregon. And day one of an eight day waterfall hunting photography trip, I was in some raging water. My tripod was about eye level. I was in my, my waders trying to stay dry. And right behind me was a section of, of rapids. And there was a rock behind me and I had to turn around and I had set my hat down and I had set my at the time, this was the, the original uh, 150 millimeter filter holder from Nisi that was for the, the Nikon 14 to 24. And this big kind of clunky oversized filter holder was sitting on this rock and I thought everything was good and safe. And I had turned back around, or I'm sorry, I had set a filter there, but the, the filter holder was still on my camera and I had turned around to set the filter down and I heard a splash and I turned around to look at my camera and my filter holder and my circular polarizer were gone. And they had fallen in the water into the white rat, white water rapids. And I had spent about an hour swimming around in that 50 degree water looking for that filter holder because I knew that the next seven days were gonna be absolute torture trying to shoot these waterfalls without a polarizer. Very, very challenging indeed, especially if you've, if you've shot with a polarizer and then you have to do without it's a tough thing to do because you know how much better the images can be with a polarizer uh, yeah enough stories this is a perfect example this is an image that was actually taken on the trip the following year um, 
going back and reshooting a lot of these scenes with a polarizer. And you can see how lush and green all of these maidenhair ferns are and the ferns in the foreground, the moss and the trees and the way that the water has very, very nice definition and texture. And that just would not have been possible without the polarizer. These maidenhair ferns are somewhat reflective. So the overhead light that I had that day, they would have been really glaring and I wouldn't have been able to get as much detail out of them. I wouldn't have been able to get as much nice warm saturation out of those greens either. So polarizers in scenes like this are absolutely essential. So if you do not have one, make sure that you get one. Uh, again, recapping the fact that they reduce glare, they help strengthen and give structure and contrast to water surface and in, in, in good uh, saturation throughout the foliage. This is a perfect example of where a polarizer was doing good things in parts of the image and not so great things in other parts of the image. And uh, essentially the, the two parts that are covered in this blue overlay now are taken with without a polarizer. Um, the reason I did this is because whenever you shoot with a wide angle lens and a polarizer, you tend to get this large, this blob in the sky where it's, it's, it's unevenly polarizing parts of the sky because it's not all on the same plane. The lens is convex, your depth of field is, is, is curved. Um, your focal plane is curved and of course it's trying to cover a large field of view and because of what i said earlier about how the light is a, uh, how a polarizer in its effectivity is based on how the light is entering the lens um, the wider field of view obviously certain parts of the sky are not going to be being lit from the same direction as other parts of the sky so you you end up with this large blob in the sky and it's usually very unattractive um, whereas the parts of the scene that are outside of the main reflection are, we're, we're getting a nasty glare because there was so, such a bright sunset that it had, you know, there was a lot of light going on all over the place. And to reduce the glare, reduce the reflection, I had rotated it off and then blended the image all back together in order to get all of the bits and pieces that I really wanted. And I felt like, that was the best way to use the polarizer in that particular situation. I really wanted to make sure that I, I got all the best pieces and, and didn't have any distracting glare anywhere and that the, the, the greens looked great and that the light was, the sky was evenly polarized and um, I think it came out great. It's been one of my most popular images ever. To kind of recap again what a polarizer does and, and give you a little bit of illustration on on how the two different filters that are sandwiched into a polarizer work. Um, you've got light that's sort of bouncing from all over a million directions coming into the filter. And that first UV filter helps sort of take some of that random light and make it less random. And then once you kind of add in that quarter wave retarder, it helps take the, the less random light and make it even less random. Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to explain the science behind a polarizer in a way that, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it's just magic. That's all you need to know is that it's pure magic. Um, but I have a little video here to show you on how as I rotate the polarizer, you'll see this, the difference in the way the, the water looks and the way that the sky looks. And you can see as I rotate through, you've got this dark blob. And this, of course, was, this was shot with the, the Sony 12 millimeter lens. It's a very wide field of view to exaggerate that big blue blob. But you can see that as I rotate through, this glare on the water and the light here, the intense light sort of goes away. And now I can see through the water surface and I, can, I get better highlights in the ripples and the little plunges. And it helps take away some of the distracting light that's on these rocks. Um, 
but it doesn't always do things that you like to the sky. You know, it sort of changes the color of the blue in the sky. And you know, that's an easy fix with white balance. But you can see how it, it, it darkens parts of the sky while not darkening other parts of the sky. So when you're using a polarizer, just be conscious of what it's doing to your scene and, and decide for yourself if that's something that you want you want to happen or not. I've got a few examples here again of, of how I use a polarizing filter. This is the uh, Narrows in Zion National Park, and it is a place that I would not be caught dead without a polarizer because you've got these huge sandstone walls and you think to yourself, well, sandstone is not very reflective. But remember that this canyon was carved by millions and millions of years of water erosion. Uh, all of these walls are, are polished. So they do reflect some light. And of course, if we can reduce the glare there, we're able to kind of coax out that really, really, really beautiful red, orange color that, that, that these rocks are composed of. And then you get the beautiful teal blue water that flows through this canyon. And if you can use a polarizer to reduce some of that glare, you get to see all the beautiful rocks that sort of live beneath the water surface. Uh, and it helps, of course, reduce the glare on the foliage. So you're able to get more color and more pop out of them as well. So this, this is exactly when you would want to have a polarizer. And the polarizer is good for this entire scene. There's nothing in this image that suffers from any negative effects from a polarizer. It's another great example. Uh, this image is from the Oregon coast. It's a combination of several different frames to sort of get all of the pieces in the wave action that I wanted, the right clouds in the right place, and, and everything sort of came together uh, to form this beautiful, moody scene. And I really, really, really needed to use a polarizer to cut some of the haze that was happening here. So if you've ever shot in the Oregon coast, and there's a marine layer around. And of course the waves are churning, it's, you know, tide is coming in and there's a lot of mist around. And it was so misty. Using a polarizer actually helped reduce some of the misty atmosphere that was going on, but not so much that it completely disappears. Still get that beautiful, nice atmospheric feeling without overwhelming amounts of, of haze. Uh, and again, it helped sort of give contrast to the water, separate the, the the churning bits from the, the, the less churny bits. And I was able to get a lot of nice wave action and motion in the water uh, while still able to see some of these specular highlights that are lighting the waves and the rocks. And uh, again, another situation where polarizer did a really great job. Now, because of the angle of the light here coming right into the lens, uh, there was, there's, you know, the, the chance for glare to happen within the lens itself, bouncing around between the polarizer and the front of your lens, bouncing around in between the quarter wave retarder and the, the linear polarizer, um, dust spots, um, water spots. So you, you constantly have to need to be wiping your lens in situations like this, but also be mindful um, of dust on your lens and dust kind of in between your lens and on your polarizer because uh, you're going to spend a lot of time sort of goofing with that stuff in post-processing when you don't really want to. Got another example for you here. This one's from Washington, um, from the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, a uh, very famous waterfall. Uh, this, this view is not accessible now, I'm told. I'm told that there's this walkway and there's an overlook, uh, which is probably better off because the, the flora here, the moss and the plant life, uh, it was really hurting and you can even see here in the midground. Uh, I'm doing my best in this shot to be careful and mindful of where I'm standing and, and actually where I'm sort of upside down uh, crouched into this tiny little cavern to try to get this perspective on these plants is very uncomfortable. I spent about an hour in this position just getting the waiting for the wind to stop enough to capture all the, the plants from blowing around to dial in the exposure and dial in the shutter speed that I wanted to capture the water how I envisioned, uh, but without really being able to see the viewfinder on the camera because of the contorted position that I was in. 
And I'm not a small guy. I'm 6'2", I'm 275 pounds. Uh, so fitting into this tiny little spot to get this shot was very, very tricky for me. Um, but it's one of my favorite images of all time. And it, again, would not have been possible without a polarizer. So thank you, Nisi, for providing me with polarizer so I can take images like this. <clears throat> all right, let's move on. Let's talk about ND filters, neutral density filters. Um, I find that these outside of cinema are, are, are more of a creative tool. Um, if you like to take long exposures where the water is very, very, very soft, or if you're going for a very, very minimalistic scene with pure pilings in the water or tall buildings with clouds racing overhead, um, ND filters are great for that because again, they're like sunglasses for your camera and they force your camera to see less. So you have to therefore either raise your ISO or elongate your shutter speed uh, or open up your aperture. But if you're going for those long exposures, you're still gonna be using an appropriate aperture for your scene. You're still going to be wanting to use as low of an ISO as you can for, for image quality. So using these filters allows you to essentially elongate your shutter speed and achieve different effects based on their density. Uh, I typically carry a three-stop ND filter with me. I carry a polarizer, a three-stop ND, and a two-stop soft grad. Those are the three filters that I carry with me almost everywhere. And the three-stop is, for me, just enough to achieve the sort of shutter speed that you see here, anywhere from a half to a quarter second. This is pretty similar, and this one's just a hair longer. Because when you use a three-stop ND filter in conjunction with a polarizer, polarizer can stop anywhere from about one and a half to two stops of light. So now that three-stop with a polarizer has become a four and a half to five stop, and you're able to get longer shutter speeds. A lot of times when I'm shooting in, um, what I would consider good light for some of these scenes. I don't even need the three-stop ND filter because the polarizer is cutting enough light for me to achieve that third of a second, quarter of a second, half a second shutter speed. Uh, but in, in certain situations, the three-stop ND comes in real handy because let's say it's not uh, dusk or dawn or golden hour or blue hour, and you've got just moody clouds overhead and you want to take some longer exposures. A three-stop ND filter is perfect for that because you throw that on, you throw the polarizer on and now you've got a four and a half to five stop ND and you should easily be able to achieve that quarter second, half a second, the shutter speed with a very low aperture or ISO during those times of day. Uh, you can see here, this is the Nikon D850 with 24 to 70 and this is a CPL and a three-stop ND filter. And I was in uh, Mono Lake in California trying to shoot these really cool um, calcified sand tufa formations and letting the waves sort of lap the shore and create a nice long exposure effect. Um, they're great for capturing cloud movement. Um, it's not something that I use very often in my own photography, but um, the fine art black and white imagery absolutely sings when you've got some beautiful clouds rushing overhead and you've managed to take a 10 or 15 or 20 minute long exposure using a 10 stop or a 15 stop ND filter. So there's a lot of uses for these. Um, you know, you, you could be on the beach and have this beautiful minimalistic scene where you've got clouds rushing toward you, waves rushing toward you, nothing but a horizon line to separate the two and you throw on a, on a, on a, a big dense ND filter and you take a very long exposure and now you've got this beautiful scene that's very, very minimalist, but you, you have all of this movement and motion. And uh, I, I do enjoy them. It's just not something that I use a whole lot of my own photography. Uh, they come in densities from one stop to, I've seen 20 stop ND filters now, and, and I'm not up to date with everything that Nisi offers, but I'm pretty sure Nisi has an ND filter to cover every situation you could possibly ever find yourself in. So definitely check those out if any of the things that I sort of mentioned technique wise are something that appeal to you. Um, this scene was taken in, in Zion National Park last year, um, just after a, a great uh, 
workshop was my first workshop ever in Zion National Park and it went great. Uh, and afterwards I had been, I had continued scouting for future workshops and I stumbled onto this beautiful scene. And I thought to myself, how great would this look at twilight? So I came back the next morning, bright and early, had sat here, set up my composition, ate my granola bar, drank some water and, and realized that the clouds were starting to form and they were moving very, very, very slowly. Um, my technique for shooting this kind of scene is to get there and shoot the stars when it's still dark pretty much and then waiting 15 or 20 so minutes before I start to get some ambient light from the sun and that capture the rest of the scene. And I noticed that these clouds that I could see them now with my naked eye were moving very, very slowly over the course of several test exposures. So I threw on a three stop ND filter and I let the clouds get a little soft, not so soft that they lose all of their texture and lose all of their, their shape, but the three stop ND filter allowed them to move just enough to where they have these beautiful wispy tails. And I was able to bring back in some of those stars and blend the steam back together to create the vision as I saw it while I was there. And uh, uh, I don't think it would have had the same aesthetic or the same emotional feeling as it does without the use of that filter in, in capturing those clouds the way that they were captured. So uh, I was very, very glad that I had my three stop ND filter with me that morning. Um, and uh, this is a, another use of, of a filter that I think is, is probably non-traditional because it, I didn't use it for the whole scene. I wasn't trying to go for a, a hugely dramatic effect. Uh, it was just a very small effect to give just a hint of motion in the scene. And, and I absolutely loved the result. Typically though, I would not use the ND filter for the whole scene, like I mentioned, because if the wind is blowing at all, then all of the foliage that's in your scene, anything that's not static, anything that is able to move with any amount of wind is gonna blur. And we certainly don't want that. Don't mind the noise. My dog's taking a nap behind me and she's having a dream. Uh, neutral density filters can be sort of tricky as you get into very, very dense, um, is as your density increases, I'm sorry. And it can begin to be very difficult to calculate your shutter speed because your camera, it reaches a point at certain densities where the metering system no longer works. And it, 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 using aperture priority or shutter priority, it can't tell you what your shutter speed should be. Um, so Nisi has this great app this great uh, ND calculator where you can basically take a test shot with no, no filter on at all, and then choose an ND filter, punch in your settings, and it'll tell you how long your shutter speed needs to be. Um, so it takes all the guesswork out of, of, of what, your shutter, should, what shutter speed should be based on the, the ND filter that you're using. Um, this is a good example here on the right where I stacked a 10 stop and a six stop ND filter. This is what that looks like. And I took this scene, no filter at all, F16, 1, 2, 50 of a second and ISO 50. Punched that in and then told it what ND filter I wanted to use and I essentially added them together. And well, that should have said 16 stops, but forgive me. And this ended up being a four minute and 22 second exposure at ISO 50 at F16. And you can see how much the clouds have moved over that time. So if you can envision that effect with other scenes that you may shoot over houses or buildings or oceans or, or anything, you're gonna get this beautiful motion and movement of these clouds. And you, you sort of control that based on the density of the filter that you choose. There we go. That's where I got the number from. Four minutes and 22 seconds. And then you hit go and it, it has a built-in timer. So you don't have to guess either. You, you hit your shutter button on your remote, your intervalometer, or you hit the shutter on the camera with the two second timer. 
and you let it roll. And of course, when it finishes, you stop your exposure and there you go. Very, very simple. Here's a few examples of where I would use an ND filter, some of them in conjunction with a circular polarizer. And I'll sort of walk you through how I use the different filters in the different images. Uh, one here on the left, no polarizer. Uh, don't think I had it on me that day, or I may have lent it out to one of my students. This was taken during my very first ever Glacier National Park workshop. And we had this beautiful teal water flowing down from Swift Current Lake in this ex explosion of a sunset. And uh, I was absolutely blown away. And I, I remember wishing that I had had a circular polarizer, but luckily, based on the angle of the light, it didn't really make much of a difference. I was still able to extract a lot of the texture and the movement in the water, and I was able to get the shutter speed I wanted with that two-stop ND filter. So it was, it was very handy to have, and I don't think it would have had quite the same effect or the same emotional feeling or drama as it does without that filter. This shot here in the middle of top is taken in Acadia National Park in Maine. And I believe I used a 10 stop and a circular polarizer for that. And the, the reason is, is that this was taken midday. Uh, I was exploring the place for my very first time and really wanted to come away with something that was pretty neat. I had these cool storm clouds sort of moving around in the background, uh, but they weren't moving very much. And these beautiful round boulders that Katie has sort of kind of become known for uh, in the foreground. And I wanted to make sure that I was using a polarizer so that I could see through the water surface because I didn't really know how this exposure was going to come out because waves are lapping back and forth over and over and over and over again. And over the course of several minutes using a 10 stop ND filter, I was able to achieve this really, really misty look. And with the circular polarizer being able to see through that mist, I think it created a, a great effect. And uh, in terms of my whole portfolio, I've only got a handful of black and white images, and this one's one of them. Uh, and it's still to this day one of my one of my my more favorite images because it's a uh, was taken sort of at a very uh, pivotal time in my photography where I felt like I was really starting to to figure it all out. And uh, this shot here, just below it, taken in Utah, um, a place called Swiss Cheese Falls. Uh, you can see that the, the rocks here are, are eroded in a, a very unique way, and, and hence its nickname, Swiss Cheese Falls. But you've got this beautiful sandstone that, again, because of years and years and millions of years of erosion, has become polished and it's shiny. So a polarizer was essential. But this pool of water, because of the very light flow of water coming into this pool, there were bubbles and leaves that were creating a very, very messy, very chaotic um, area in the bottom corner of this photograph. And it was very distracting. And I could not achieve a slow enough shutter speed to blur them out completely. Because we know that if we take a, a very, very long exposure, anything that's moving throughout the scene eventually just blurs completely. And sometimes you can't even see it. So. Pro tip, if you're ever shooting street photography and there's a million people walking around, throw on all of your ND filters, get the most density you could possibly get and take your exposure. And over the course of all those minutes, all those people walking back and forth are gonna disappear. And you can end up with a scene that would have a thousand people walking around it with your naked eye, but looks almost completely deserted in the camera. Uh, it's a pretty cool, pretty cool technique. Uh, but I needed the six stop ND filter here to take a long enough exposure to have that effect in that pool. And I got almost all of the movement gone uh, to where you can't see the bubbles in the, in the leaves that were creating the distraction that I didn't like. But over the course of those few, those few minutes, this tree was blowing all over the place. And the water sort of got softer than I would have liked. I'm, I'm sorry, where the, 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 the plummeting water got softer than I would have liked. So I ended up taking several exposures here and using this whole section here with the six stop ND filter and the rest of it with just a polarizer so that I was able to get that nice red rock, the beautiful yellow tree and get rid of all the glare on the rest of the rocks in the scene. 
So a little, uh, little tag team effort on a six stop and a polarizer for that image. Moving over to this upper right image, this is taken again on the Oregon coast, um, a, a place that can be very dangerous depending on the tide. Uh, this was taken during last year's Oregon coast workshop and it was the last night of that trip and we had had amazing light every sunrise and sunset and it was the most spectacular few days of my photographic life, I think, uh, especially as a teacher and instructor. We watched this storm and we, we were starting to lose all hope for this light and it eventually broke. And if you look real closely, you can see just spouts of, of rain just dumping down and it was just incredible. And I thought, what an incredible contrast between these textured, moody, dramatic clouds when they are captured motionless, when they are frozen in time, but allowing the waves in the foreground to blur slightly. So this is a situation where I used a three-stop ND filter to capture everything from the horizon down with a polarizer to get as much movement and motion that I could. And then throwing on the two stop reverse grad, taking off the three stop ND filter and capturing everything from the horizon up, moving very, very quickly, as quickly as I could um, to freeze these clouds exactly where they were so that they maintained as much texture, clarity and structure that they, they could and letting the water in the foreground get a little softer so that you've got all of the, the elements and it feels, you know, it's a sense of, of, of motion. And uh, to me, this, this directly replicates exactly the experience I had when I was there photographing with my group. But again, you know, another creative use for using different filters together and separately. <laughs> this bottom image here, some of you may know this place is in Death Valley. It's the racetrack Playa. These are the sailing stones the stones that the aliens have moved over thousands of years. Um, uh, this is after a long night of camping there with a workshop group and shooting these all night long and waking up in the morning to these storm clouds pushing through and the temperature had plummeted that night. Um, but I really wanted to capture some movement in those clouds. Uh, contrastly to the image above it, I thought that by letting the clouds sort of move, or blur and then these rocks being motionless but having the evidence of motion over the thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years that they've been there would be a great contrast so i've got some clouds that are moving slightly coming at me and also the trails of rocks coming at me this image is called push and uh, i think it makes a lot of sense because it feels like everything's sort of pushing at me um, but I, I use a three-stop ND filter to achieve just a small amount of movement in those clouds. And I think it was essential to pulling off the aesthetic of the shot that I wanted. Moving on. Let's get into graduated nuclear density filters. And graduated nuclear density filters are different in that only part of the filter has any density. Uh, but these come in a, a variety of, of shapes, sizes, and, and uh, types of, of graduation where you have density built up in the middle that gradiates outward to no density in the top or bottom. You've got uh, ones that are most dense at the top, and by the time they reach the bottom of the, the filter, there's no density. Um, there's a bunch of them, and they all sort of have their own, their own purposes and their, their own time to shine in the, the photography uh, scene. And I typically will carry only a graduated ND filter, but there are times where I know that I'm gonna be going and shooting a canyon top, where I'm not gonna have a lot of things sticking above the horizon, like the north of the Grand Canyon or any part of the Grand Canyon, uh, canyon lands in Utah, or if I'm going to the ocean and I know that there's not, you know, there's not gonna be sea stacks or lighthouses or anything sticking up above the horizon, that's the perfect time to use a reverse grad or to use a hard-edged graduated neutral density filter um, or a medium grad because you're not gonna have the adverse effects of it darkening anything that's sticking up above the horizon. But in scenes where you do have things sticking up above the horizon, um, 
those are situations where a graduated ND filter of any kind might create more issues than it than it than it fixes because it's it's already darkening anything that's being backlit if you're shooting toward the sun and then that can create other issues where you've got these really really dark mountains or sea stacks or trees or buildings or what have you so those situations i might use a, an nd filter for the sky and then take it off and take the landscape or i might just bracket and blend images back together uh, but in any case graduated images and empty filters all have their time and place the example here that I show you on the right is of a canyon top in canyon lands or near canyon lands. And it's a very, very dynamic scene because as soon as the sun hits the horizon, either at sunset or sunrise, the entire canyon is in shadow. But everything above the horizon is very, very, very bright. And most of the time, it's too dynamic for your camera to capture all in one scene. So you have a choice of either bracketing, taking multiple exposures, or you use a graduated ND filter and you get it all in one shot. Um, it's six in one, half dozen in the other. It kind of depends on your proficiency in post-processing uh, filters or, or how you feel about blending images. If you don't want to blend images and you just want to get it in the camera, graduated filters are the way to go in a scene like that. <clears throat> this is just going to kind of illustrate the different types of GNDs we talked about. This is the one that I typically carry in my bag because it has the softest transition, which I think makes it the most versatile of all the graduated ND filters because you can raise it or lower it within the filter holder to kind of control what's being darkened and what's not. Um, it does have its, its shortcomings, again, with anything that's kind of above the horizon that's going to be darkened or backlit and, and darkened further by the ND filter. Of course, that's not something we want because now it's it's taking the scene that's already dynamic and, and sometimes making it a little bit more dynamic and we need to adjust our exposure you need to watch your histogram and make sure that your blacks aren't clipping uh, lots of things that you have to think about when you're using these so soft grad hard grad you can see that the uh the density is is built up most at the top but it has a very very short gradation where it goes from dense to not dense and uh these are are great for ocean scenes for uh, canyon scenes, stuff like that. And then you've got this, this reverse grad, which I find more practical and more uh, has more uses than this hard grad because most of the density is built up right here at the middle of the filter. So if you're thinking about this and you're looking at this beautiful canyon scene and you've got the sun rising in your face or setting in your face, the most dynamic, the brightest part of that scene is gonna be right there right on the horizon. So having the density built up right in the middle is going to allow you to put that right over the brightest part of that scene and then taper off toward the top and have no density down below. So I, I find these more practical than, than the hard grads for that reason, because they have more real life landscape photography uses. A few examples of how I would use these graduated ND filters. Um, this scene taken in Hawaii, same thing. Uh, I used a hard edge. I didn't have a reverse grad with me. This was a very, very quick three-day trip to shoot the lava with a friend. Uh, used a three-stop hard grad because the sun was very high in the sky and there was a lot of smoke in the air from the lava flow and it was diffusing the light and, and making it beautiful, but it was still very dynamic because I'm shooting directly at it. So all this stuff down here that's backlit uh, was all very, very, very deep shadow. So using a three-stop hard grad allowed me to essentially expose for those shadows, but still have the highlights in check. So I didn't have to take multiple exposures. Um, you know, when you're shooting scenes like this and you're trying to get just the right wave motion, but you're also trying to think about taking a filter, taking a filter off, putting a filter on, you've got too many things going on. Sometimes it just makes the most sense put the filter on and then you can just focus on what you're trying to capture. Uh, this, this image here, dynamic in a similar way, but the canopy of the trees, because they were being lit from above, uh, it was a very overcast day in Pennsylvania, not too far from where I grew up. Uh, Dan, you'll know this place is Ricketts Glen. Uh, it's obviously not one of the iconic falls, but this is just a beautiful little scene that I came across while there. 
And the soft red helped me really control the light that was happening in the trees uh, so that I could focus on getting the right motion in the water. This would have been blown out. I would have lost a lot of the color. And again, using a circular polarizer really helped here because I was able to get a lot of contrast in the water, remove glare from unwanted areas, and saturate and richen up the colors in the, in the, the trees. This scene down below, reverse grad, for exactly the reasons that I mentioned on the slide before. This area is the most dense or, or the most dynamic and bright part of this whole scene. And all this stuff is backlit falling into shadow. So using a three-stop reverse grad here allowed me to expose for these shadowy areas and still control most of these highlights. It ended up being so dynamic that I still had a little bit of highlights blow out. Um, but in certain cases, I'm okay with that. Um, but it certainly helped get a lot more cloud texture and exposed for these clouds better than it would have had I not had a three-stop grad. Uh, same thing here watching the storm roll in, watching these clouds push through and, and capturing the lightning there was, was important. And I needed to try to harness the dynamics of the scene because I knew the moments were gonna be fleeting and they weren't gonna last long. Oops, sorry. Um, perfect example of using a three-stop ND filter is trying to you know, get all of the scene balanced in the camera and watching your histogram, making sure your blacks aren't clipped, your whites aren't clipped. Uh, and, and as you do that, and as you practice uh, using these different densities of filters, you'll start to, it almost becomes second nature. You'll know by looking at the histogram and looking at the scene, okay, a two-stop filter is not going to be enough. I need a three-stop filter, and then I need an ND, and then maybe I need a polarizer. And you'll start to, to really get a feel for how to use these filters and, and when. Uh, there's too many filters to discuss. As we've said, there's, there's filters for night photography, the Nisi Natural Night Filter, which helps kind of filter out some of the sodium, sodium vapor bulbs that you get in like street lights, and that nasty sort of yellow, orange ochre light that you get that, that's really, really nasty uh, when you're trying to shoot the Milky Way uh, in, near a bigger city. Um, they're great for that. Uh, You've got filters that will help diffuse the stars and make them a little hazier. That's not their intended use, but the filter actually works great for that. Um, you've got filters that alter colors. You've got different types of polarizers that have slightly different um, color rendering. You've, you've got all different types of things for whatever it is that you want to use them for, whatever you like to shoot. Uh, and Nisi carries them all. I think that was it. Uh, I kind of sped through that. I wasn't really sure how much time I had. So, Jim, do you need me to eat up a few more minutes or do no, we have that was questions? All, that was all great. And what I am going to do is the, um, the one question that came up earlier, because I'm going to let everyone do, do their own questions, uh, okay. is that um, you know, we, I, if I recall right, you like a traditional uh, polarizer and we have yes. an enhanced polarizer and someone had asked, you know, what's the difference between them? I had put up a link to our uh, blog that actually explains them in, in, in sort of a features type of a, of a fashion as to how to differentiate between them. Okay. What do you, what what are your thoughts? I am I right? You like a traditional polarizer? Yes. Uh, I had tried the enhanced and I tried the landscape polarizer, and um, because I'm so picky about color, I found that um, some of the colors using the enhanced polarizer. Uh, I was sort of battling with and post processing. If I remember right, there was like a slight, almost magenta cast. Um, and I don't know if it was now having played with the Sony a little bit, I'm learning that um, when I'm trying to convert raw files in Lightroom with Sony, I end up getting a pink color cast um, versus when I'm, um, converting in Capture One, I don't get that pink color cast. So now I'm like trying to figure out if it wasn't something that I was seeing 
you know, version it, it process. Actually, it actually, if if Andrew would come on, uh, it's actually an interesting thing. I think some of the color shifting has to do with exposure, and I think it's when it's slightly underexposed, it can start to pick up a little bit of magenta. I use the filter all the time, and I've I've. I've experienced that, but it's not generally what I get. Everyone, this happens to be uh, Andrew uh, from Nisi. He's actually coming in from Sydney, Australia. Hi, Andrew. Hey, and thanks, uh, uh, Jim and Josh. Um, the enhanced polarizer actually will typically give you a cooler color tone. So it's more on the bluer side rather than a magenta. But what it does differently to the standard uh, pro CPL is it increases the saturation. The actual performance in cutting down the glare is the same, but the the it is a cooler tone, more on the the, the bluer side. Whereas a standard polarizers, most polarizers actually warm, um, and you'll get a warmer tone. So uh, almost every polarizer on the market, if you test it, it will give it'll be more on the warmer side. Right. Um, so yeah, our landscape's just on the cooler side. Um, but it does increase the saturation a little bit. And it and it's really just a matter of what you like and and having a greater number of colors on your palette so that you can have more freedom to create. So what I'm going to do is, and I know a few people have asked questions, go ahead and um, everyone who's participating, there's 56 of you here. If you want to ask a question, turn your mic on. Uh, you can turn your camera on as well. Ask the question. Once you've asked your question, please shut your mic and back off. Hi, Daniel. Hey, Dan. <laughs> Dan's mic is off. All right. Hey, Hi, here we go. Hey, Dan. How you doing? Good. Good. Great presentation you had there. Thanks. Hope you, hope you can get up this way sometime. We'll get out and do some shooting again. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to try. I think I might try to get back later this month. You know, uh, not everybody knows my dad's very, very sick right now. Um, he's battling cancer and uh, it's been very, very difficult being uh, all the way across the country from him right now. So I'm going to try to get back over there later this month and, and see him. So I'll make sure I bring my gear this time and, and hopefully we'll get out and shoot a little. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'll. It, it, it gives you it gives you a chance to sort of uh, break away and take a breath. Daniel, where where are you located? I'm in Owego, New York. Okay, so you're still there. Josh has moved on, moved on, and you're still there. He's uh, still there. <laughs> he moved on to bigger and better things, but wow, <laughs> I, I keep an eye on him all the time. <laughs> all right. Well, somebody had asked about bracketing. Did yeah. That uh, Josh, do you exposure bracket and allow Photoshop to combine it for you? I do not. I like to have full control over how I blend the exposures. Um, I, I don't love the, the look of HDR images. Sometimes you're, you're sort of over bracketing or you're capturing too much dynamic range. And uh, sometimes I can do funky things to colors because now you've got to try to, to add your contrast back in because you're capturing every available stop of light and when you blend that all together uh sometimes it can minimize it can it can reduce the contrast so now you've got to build the contrast back in and when you add contrast colors get saturated differently um, and i find that it's harder to achieve uh, more natural but yet vibrant looking colors when you use hdr functionality uh, whether that be photoshop or lightroom or, or whatever uh, versus manually blending the exposures back together with using like uh, luminosity masks or something like that. Okay. Um, this question might need to be answered by Andrew, but uh, I know, I don't believe you're uh, a user of the natural night. You, you like to do your stuff with in post with your night photography. Yes. I but for a couple of reasons. One, I'm not usually around places that have a lot of light pollution. Um, now I am more than ever being close to Phoenix, but um, it does tend to stop a little bit of light. So when you're shooting at night, and I tend to stack multiple exposures to try to get rid of the noise, uh, I'm already shooting at an ISO of 10,000 or 12,800. And being able to stop or, or having to stop down even more 
or, or open up ISO even more to overcome the, the light that that filter is stopping. Um, it just is more of a challenge for me, but for single exposures in areas that are, that are, are heavily light polluted, it's a great filter to have. Well, here's the question. And like I said, Andrew might need to pipe in on this. What are the best settings to use the Nisi natural night filter in terms of white balance settings? It seems to have a strong magenta color cast. Now, I believe you should use daylight as your, uh, as your white balance. Am I correct, Andrew? There he is. Uh, yes, Jim, that's correct. Daylight white balance is the best setting uh, for the natural night filter. Um, it'll give the most natural look. Um, how, how the natural night works is it actually filters out different um, lights and different spectrums. Um, and it, it mainly affects that um, the sodium, the yellows and the oranges from street lights. So it does very well at reducing those. Um, and it will also um, uh, help with the contrast, particularly in, in the blacks as well. Um, so that's where the filter get, gets, has, has a great benefit um, compared I'll, uh, to not using it. I'll mention that on March 29th, we're going to be having, and Josh, please check in because even your comments at the end would be so welcome. On, uh, on um, March 29th, we're going to have a gentleman named Kevin Lagore doing night, uh, night sky photography and, uh, and really concentrating on night photography and the natural night filter and, and astrophotography. He's, um, he's a, product, uh, a, a product manager for Sky Tracker, and uh, that's his area of expertise is astronomy and uh, shooting uh, night sky. So it should be a pretty interesting um, evening. I'm also going to answer another question, Josh. Um, Myrna, you had asked uh, recommendations when using mirrorless cameras, and if any. And the one recommendation I can make to you is, is that um, many of the mirrorless cameras don't use lenses that have the kind of front diameter that DSLRs use and a lot of the high-end lenses have. So if your lenses tend to be around 67 millimeter in diameter or smaller, we have a version of our filter system called the M75. It's about 40% less than the V6 system, which is what I use, Josh uses, and the majority of our, our uh, professional photographers use. It's exactly the same uh, concept, but it's just in a smaller package and it makes it less expensive. It also makes it less cumbersome, which is why you probably bought a mirrorless camera in the first place. So it's definitely something to look into, especially while we're having a sale. But Unless you're using the Sony and the uh, 12 to 24 millimeter lens like I am using to film this right now, because that takes 180 millimeter filter. <laughs> 150, dude. Oh, it's sorry, the 150. Sorry, yeah, 150. And uh, but that's a that's a fabulous holder, isn't it? Yes, I like it. It's yeah. it's I with the field of view that this lens is able to capture, uh, and having a filter that covers that field of view is pretty great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, you can just keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And uh, we, you know, I, I mean, it's cool. We have things, you know, we also have circular filters as well. So whatever you really want to do, as long as you communicate with us or our, you know, we, we're, as we roll out to more authorized dealers, um, you know, you should be able to call them up and say, well, this is what I'm using, what's right for me. And hopefully, hopefully you'll get good advice. Josh is a great source for, um, the filters and what might be a good filter to get and everything. And he's always there to give you a good deal on a filter as well. Um, we at Nisi provide full support on everything. So you just call our, um, our office here in Los Angeles or chat with us or send us an email and we'll, we'll answer questions until you're satisfied with that. 
Hello, Brandon Black. What's up, buddy? Hey, Josh. How are you? Good, man. How you doing? I'm good, man. I can't complain. <laughs> long time no see. Yeah, long time no see. The beer looks good, man. The goat's yeah, good. Hey, it, it, it'll be gone in a couple of weeks, unfortunately. <laughs> That's another story. Uh, I was um, about to mention. Oh, go ahead, Brandon. No, go ahead. What did you say? I was just about to mention that back. At, I've been using EC filter since 2015, since uh, it was kind of what what really got me absolutely hooked and head over heels on landscape photography um, because I was an engineer previously and I never really uh, ever touched photography previous to 2013 that, that winter. So um, it was finding filters and learning that I could do all of these cool effects and start to blend images together. That is really what hooked me. Um, do you recall how you found Nisi filters back then? I think I was using the Nikon, I was using the Nikon 14 to 24. And at the time, the only two people that had a filter holder were Lee filters and the photo Diox by Wonderpana. And both of them, I tried both of them. I bought the Wonderpana and it was this huge clunky thing. I couldn't, I had to leave part of it attached and I couldn't fit it in my camera bag. So then I got rid of it and I went to the, the leaf filter holder and it was the same sort of thing. This big clunky filter holder that had to be partially left on, or you had to take it off, and get it apart. Um, and then I found Nisi and that first version of the Nisi filter holder for the 14 to 24 simply slipped on and you had a little thumb screw that you tightened and it was the most easy to use most quick to use filter holder that i had come across and that after that i was like all right this is it like they thought about it they got it right and it's it's just going to be nisi from from here on out that's really cool thank you yeah thank you so um listen like i said uh hey richard uh like i said you know, Joshua's, um, you know, not feeling great. I think we should get to a point of wrapping up. So I'll give a last shout out to people that if you have any questions, turn your mic, mic on, ask away. But otherwise, I'd like to wrap it up for him. Brandon, what did you have? No, I've seen it come up a couple of times throughout the your talk, but they're asking about the composites, how you blending your images. Like I know, I know when you're talking about taking three or four images, but I guess maybe explain the post-processing part of it, how you bring it all back together. Certainly. Um, there's a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I, I love Photoshop and I love being able to use layers and selections and being able to select colors and different luminosity values and stuff like that to blend images back together. So I'm, I'm sort of thinking about all this stuff in the field and, and, you know, just thinking back to the shot of that maroon bells where I knew part of it I wanted to use with the polarizer active and part of it without the polarizer. I'm trying to visualize in my mind, you know, where I'm going to, blend these two images, what I'm going to make selections of um, to sort of cut them apart, deconstruct the shot and put it back together. Uh, and of course, all of that is done manually. I use a Wacom tablet with a pen um, so that I can make really, really, really very finely, uh, very, very, very accurate selections. I use luminosity selections to target brightness values and darkness values. I use color selections to target certain colors. So unfortunately, there's no real one quick answer on how I blend my images back together. Um, sometimes it takes multiple different techniques and different types of selections and, and all okay. using photoshops and different types of layers. That would make an awesome video. Hey, I, while there's still a bunch of people on, do you want to talk about that one workshop that you're still looking? You've got a couple yeah. of thoughts left. Yeah, absolutely. That, that would be great, Jim. Um, I'll skip past that. Uh, you can sign up. Uh, go to my website, jsnowphotography.com. I've got a bunch of stuff on there. I've got video tutorials, and some of them involve blending. So if you do want to know how I blend some of my images, there's video tutorials on there. I've got articles on focus stacking, focal length blending, uh, all the kind of stuff that I use uh, in my own personal photography, uh, stuff that people don't generally talk about because it's a little taboo, but it's stuff that I use and that I love. Um, but I've got this workshop here, Arizona Nights. It's coming up really, really, really fast, March 10th through 14th here in Phoenix. 
well, partially in Phoenix, partially in another part of Arizona, um, but I've got a last minute opening and I'm co-leading it uh, with a very good friend of mine, Jessica Santos. She's, or Santos. Great. She's great. She was one of my students on a Death Valley workshop years ago. We've been great friends ever since. Actually, Brandon Black, Brandon's still there. He was on that workshop with Jess and I, and uh, he was there at the racetrack playa uh, <laughs> where we swear we saw ghosts. Um, but yeah, so Jess and I are doing this workshop March 10th through 14th, and we've got one last opening, and it's going to be a heck of a time. Um, That'd be cool. Well, if anyone, if, if anyone wants to grab it, or you can refer someone to Josh, um, all I can tell you is this one, one time I'm going to latch on to you, Josh, and go along with you. I'll be the one. Oh, that'd be great, Jim. I'd love to have you. I'll be in the back complaining about that. <laughs> You'll probably be the guy falling asleep because there's always one. There's always one That's guy. Great. You got it. That's uh, <laughs> All right. So listen, if we can, uh, so we've got this. Uh, Andrew, if you could throw up the uh, slide with the uh, coupon again. You want me to stop sharing my screen, Jim? Yes, please. Okay. All right. Signing off. <laughs> And uh, there we go. So uh, if you need anything, uh, take advantage of the 15% off. It's good until March 15th. Uh, the the uh, coupon code's simple enough. Uh, if you have any questions about anything, you can call us. Um, these filters are also available with Josh. Um, you can probably work something out for you, Josh, if you want to offer this as well. Okay. So whichever way it goes. But um, I'm going to call in a night and just say thank you very much. Excuse me, Jim. You're you're great, and you're 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 great. You're great. I. <laughs> Excuse Thanks, me, Jim. Jim. I have a quick it's, question. It's, oh, go we ahead. got we got somebody. Go ahead. Can 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 you send out an email? What uh, that new one? The nice guy on on the. On the 26th, I believe, of April, you said? Oh, 29th? Yes. 29th. Actually, follow us on Instagram. You'll get it. But if you um, if you put an email into chat, I'll grab it, too, and make sure you get it. Okay, thanks. You got it. Every Jim, every what? There's, there's still a few questions in the chat box. I don't know if you want to address. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought I would ask everyone. Okay, Jim, can you help me with my purchase of my M75? Yes, I can. You just, direct, uh, oh, that was a direct message. Um, uh, Linda, if you can hear me, put your uh, email in direct to me and I'll get back in touch with you. Uh, somebody told me how wonderful I am. That's always nice to hear. Uh, I shoot with a Canon A7R3. Should the start pack plus still be good? I did not think about shooting mirrorless. Uh, if you're going to go with some of the, you know, an A7R shooter is going to um, probably get into some of the better Nikon, uh, the Sony lenses with the bigger front. So I think the V6 is the way to go. I would agree. Uh, I know starry landscape stackers used to stack many star sky images to reduce the noise, but it could also be used to stack many foreground images to reduce yes. the noise. Yes, it can, Lance. I don't know. Yes, it can. Yes. <laughs> okay. And um, of course, Lance was very sweet, and we all are sweet. Our 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 best our best thoughts, healing thoughts for your uh, father. I know that really sucks. So um, been through it myself. Appreciate that. And, yeah. If your lenses have a filter thread from forty nine to eighty two, check out our. Oh, that's from Andrew. All right. All right. Did I cover it? Are we done? I think we got it. I think we got them all at that time. Yeah. All right, man. You're the best. Thank you for uh, bucking up and getting through it. And My pleasure. Uh, I might have another. I might have another place for you to do this dog and po pony show s soon. Okay. Always. <laughs> all right. Cool. Good Thanks, night, Jim. Everyone. Good Thank night. you, everybody. See you next. See you. When? The twenty second. We have a gentleman named Joe Brady who's really good on photography. He's an old timer, uh, probably a real different perspective. And then the night sky on the 29th. Follow us on Instagram. You'll know all about those. Bye everyone. Good night, everybody.